here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Hello and welcome. This is The C86 Show. I'm David Eastall. As you know, we love a special guest. This week, it's going to be the turn of the American record producer, mixer, engineer, musician, and uh, yes, known for his production work and has worked with a billion bands. It is true. It is the one and only Dave Trumpio, who I spoke to very recently to find out more about life, love, poetry and everything else. Originally, well, first, the early years, he was in a band called The Pulsars and then went on to do lots of production work and has got various interesting sort of businesses that he's running now. Um, recording studios in LA, mixed with sort of um, hotels, really. But you'll find out more about that within this intre- incredibly interesting interview. Um, if you want to find out much more about Dave, and you really should, he has got a very good website, which is titled... Or just not titled, but it is kingsizesoundlabs.com. But um, there you go. You'll hear lots more about it and his work. Anyway, so after several minutes of casual chat, we got down to that exciting subject that was the early formative years. Dave, tell us everything. Tell us now. Yeah, I mean, I was born in 1968. Uh, my my parents' musical tastes were pretty straightforward, but they did... Um, have like the greatest hits of the Beatles, like the Blue Album and the Red Album, Classic. where they're standing over the banister, um, and that was like a record that never left the turntable through my childhood. Right. So you know, Beatles were like a huge, huge uh, musical influence early on, like from like as far as I can remember, um, and along with the Rolling Stones, I ended up getting like the Rolling Stones greatest hits when I was like six or something. The the one that's like the kind of cool octagon one. I, I remember through the, seen that? through the past darkly. That was the first one I got, but um, I can't remember that. Yeah. One. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, like, so, so, I mean, those are pretty classics, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, I do remember those Beatles albums. I remember a friend had them and I recorded them and, and sort of hearing, you know, like, uh, strawberry fields and stuff like that but yeah. I had an I had an older brother who was seven years older than me and he he had a huge influence because I thought he was such a cool dude and he was into the world of prog rock you know the people like yes. you know your you know um p- bit of Pink Floyd early Pink Floyd but the end it was yes yeah. and Genesis and Wishbone Ash Barkley James Harvest and the solo work yeah. of so solo work of Rick Wakeman which I also loved yeah I, but luckily he also his first couple of albums were Sergeant Pepper and Goodbye Yellow Brick Road by Elton John and this was kind of quite early mid 70s actually I sort of at the time just went into his room because I was forbidden to go into his room and play them mm-hmm. when he wasn't about and thought god this is absolutely amazing but I didn't realize the cultural context of the either and the fact that the Beatles had only just broken up really you know it's like it was only yeah. so um that was a kind of a musical education but the Beatles were huge because they there was those films that came out and we watched religiously yeah. there wasn't much else to watch really so um they were massive but also people like the monkeys and the banana splits I mean let's face oh, it yeah 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 and another big thing another big influence on my early years was Jim Croce I really, my parents had all Jim Croce's recordings and and then he died in a plane crash and that really resonated with me. I was like maybe seven or eight when that happened. And I was like, whoa, like, I did, it was like, you know, it kind of like threw me into like, you know, realizing mortality, you know, I was a big fan of him and like, I would watch his PBS specials and stuff. And then my parents were like, Dave, we have some bad news. Uh, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I that is quite weird. Croce. I was kind of obsessed with Jim Croce there for, for a while. Yes. Well, I, I sort of that that thing of death was always a bit strange when you're young, isn't it? Because I remember yeah. we, we were obsessed with Alias, is it Alias Smith and Jones, that cowboy film? You know, those two cowboy cowboys, mm-hmm. and uh, one of them had apparently killed himself. And and I found that kind of quite weird and disturbing, thinking, yes, but then they had to yeah. get a replacement for him. And um, yeah, yeah. For, for a while, I found that a bit discombobulating, really, when I was about 10. Yeah, I mean, back, that, back then, you didn't have the internet. It was like if, you know, you, obviously you had people in your family passing away and, you know, stuff like that. But that was like the first, like, whoa, like, oh, he's not making any more records, you know? Yes. <laughs> so, 
Oh, yeah. I guess for us, oh, real happy stuff we're talking about. We're, we're absolutely, absolutely. You know, it was it was kind of. I suppose it is a bit strange because we have luckily grown up to, through a period where all those people we were on the same planet as them yeah. for that period of time, and they were just <clears throat> there, sort of as some sort of foundation with all the other craziness. Yeah. So it's kind of weird when they slowly you know going but at the same time feeling very grateful the fact that we've had so such a good run basically of all these people yeah. about and um you know you can just have to look at the good side rather than the negative so we were lucky with that period so as you as we truck towards the sort of late 70s you would have been um yes getting up to 12 so actually you're you're, you're sort of i suppose it was the mid 80s when indie pop or heavy rock became part of your life yeah, well, I, I I bloomed very early with music. I I knew I wanted to do music. I wanted to play guitar. My hands weren't big enough when I was like, you know, eight, nine, ten. Um, but you know, it really changed. I mean, I had a babysitter that was really like much like your brother into prog rock. Taught me how to play bass pretty early. I like I really wanted to like learn how to play bass. And um, he was teaching me like Getty Lee bass lines from Rush and stuff like that. Right. But what really, but really, but really catapulted me was like the birth of New Wave in the late seventies and early eighties. Um, you know, seeing like B fifty twos on Saturday Saturday Night Live in America was really big for me. Like I would watch it religiously every Saturday. Yeah, and um, my parents would let me stay up. Because I, I was just really into whatever the musical guests, and back then the musical guests were incredible. It was every, it was a really great curated um, bunch of acts. But I remember seeing Devo and B 52s playing Rock Lobster. Like that blew my mind. Yeah. Um, stuff like, you know, um, Blondie and the Ramones and um I was Costello of course so that that was kind of my late 70s early 80s like you know on top of like cheap trick a lot of midwest because I grew up in Chicago so yes. we had a lot of midwest power pop like this band called the shoes and uh cheap trick um, live at the Buddha Khan was amazing yeah 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 I mean that that was like one of the, my first like records I bought like with my own money I do remember to, Frampton, you know, comes, <laughs> Frampton Comes Live was the other one, wasn't it? So we Yeah, were... yeah. So like a lot of the older kids, like my babysitters when we were kids, like, you know, or, you know, my older cousins, they were like really into Genesis, Frampton, all that kind of stuff. And because I was like so obsessed with music, like obviously I, would, I was into that too. But like what really like where I felt like, wow, now I really have something I'm going to climb onto was like that early 80s, um, late, you know, um, I mean, like the B-52's Yellow Album, R.E.M. Murmur, um, uh, oh God, you know, like all the Blondie stuff. I really loved Joan Jett in the Black Hearts back That's then. It. Yes. <laughs> so know? did you, I mean, because it was kind of interesting, you were probably... A on the other side of the water. But, you know, I suppose for me, you know, it was the punk period and then post-punk. I mean, this is kind of quite simplistic, isn't it? But there was, yeah. you know, but those bands like Wire and Magazine and Gang of Four yeah. and uh, then Marky Smith and The Fall. I mean, there was other sort of scenes as well, because, you you know, in New York, you had that whole, you had the punk world, but then you had the sort of rockabilly world of, you know, like the Cramps and the the uh, Stray Cats and the Rock Cats yeah, as well. Yeah, and, and, and the cow punk kind of thing coming then the out. Cow punk. And then, the, you yeah. know, I don't know about the, yeah, and then in the UK we had New Paisley scene, which all had those bands like the, I suppose it was, um, yeah, the Bangles. Green, green on Red. Green, green on, on red. red, I mean, yeah. that was it. Yeah. And then in this country we had the sort of like the synth bands of, I suppose, you know, Depeche Mode and Soft Cell and then that kind of world yeah. of, I suppose, you know, it became quite, I think, a bit political in the sense of, you know, it's very much part of the kind of the right of centre. You know, there was the kind of, the, I mean, even though they weren't possibly the right of centre, they kind of embodied a, a Britain that suddenly became very excited because we'd sort of won the Falkland War, which was just marvellous stuff. Yeah. I mean, and so the, you got this kind of nightclub scene, Ritz, and then you had the Duran Duran, you had Spandau Ballet. It was like, oh, my God, this is also, oh, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. I wham. love Duran Duran, Duran Duran. Um, you know, the mainstream new wave of the early 80s, but MTV changed it all for me. And that brought a lot of British acts 
to yes. my attention with the early MTV. And I, I literally watched the first episode of MTV, like the first broadcast. So like I'm tr- a truly like, and it was super resonating with me. And um, so, I guess, yeah, I, I guess at, at that stage though, a, fl- were a flock of seagulls kind of huge in your life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, well, I, like I immediately started wearing skinny ties and, you know, I bought like, you know, some used bowling shoes and, you know, <laughs> started becoming new wave, you know, and buggles, um, I suppose. Wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, totally. Like buggles. Um, but what really changed was um, I, I was uh, playing in the youth orchestra and we did a European tour one summer um, when I was pretty young. And uh, I was walking down, we were in London and I was walking down the street. And this person was wearing this T-shirt with this huge face of this guy wearing horn rim glasses. And it was uh, the Smiths. <laughs> you know? the Smiths. And I was like, I'm like, what is the Smiths? You know, and so that, that was probably um, right around, it was right before Meet is Murder. Right, so, 84. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So um, that really, like, between the Smiths, New Order, The Cure, those, that was like my main trilogy all through like the hub of the 80s. Yes. Because, you know? <laughs> because in, you know, like in that simplistic way, you know, for me, the Smiths appearing in 83 to 87, yeah. there was like this chapter that suddenly, for me, they dominated such a lot of the 80s. And then all those indie bands like that came along with them. And I suppose there just was that scene from fans like the Wolf Hands and Yeah, Yeah, No, and the Tomb Brides. And then in Australia, you had the Go-Betweens and the Triffids, and then you had the Chills yeah. from New Zealand. So there was suddenly this kind of like, it was cool to be, you know, a bit like Morrissey, really, which was fine, or Johnny yeah. Marr. So for me, that was such a kind of, they were the most important the band of the 80s, really. Yeah, um, and I, I, like, out of that, I got into, you know, Aztec Camera. Oh, actually, I got into Aztec Camera before the Smiths because of their jump cover. <laughs> yes, and but, I think, uh, uh, <laughs> and I, I, believe, yeah. I think Oblivion had come out earlier, hadn't it? It was yeah. like the yeah. early 80s. I, when, when I mentioned yeah. a flock of seagulls, because I realised they're big in America, and someone said, whether this is true, that when MTV started, they didn't have many videos. And they, you know, were looking and, and, you know, oh, we've got this one from this band, who cares, we'll just keep playing it. So they became this kind of a bit of a... You know, so for us British people wondering why why do Americans like a flock of seagulls? It's so weird. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> that was. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, there there were some great one hit wonders out of the early MTV era. But um, yeah, and I I, I really I the Smiths I really got into like the Blow Monkeys and um band like uh the jazz butcher i got into oh yes of course like like some pretty like you know kind of obscure now like kind of obscure but then i really like uh what is it dream academy i like right yes (laughs) i really early early mtv's icicle works like that was huge i love the icicle works and uh there were a lot of like cool english bands like on that early mtv that that I was definitely brought my attention to it. Yeah. And I guess, uh, you know, I mean, Duran Duran now got dates in Vegas and I guess they're sort of, they did get a big audience in there. I think they were one of the British bands that did very well in America. Cause there's a thing about British bands, you know, going, right, mm-hmm. we're going to have to do America. And they sort of go, oh shit. And they come back and think, no, we, they hate us basically. So um, yeah. it's not always the way, is it? I mean, there's a, it's a kind of well-known narrative about British bands having a bad time. And the other thing that I've noticed when I've done a lot of interviews with British bands, indie bands, the one thing that finishes them off, apart from, you know, being together for five years, um, is a tour in America is often the thing that finishes most bands off. They go, we just came back and broke up after our six weeks in America. It just broke us completely. So, yes, British bands, you know, sometimes struggle with that sort of enormous project, I suppose. hmm it's a tricky yeah. One, isn't it? yeah yeah and then like later in the 80s um started getting into more i guess it would be yeah like later eight, well got kind of more into like the american indie scene started happening and um bands like the pixie surfer rosa and you know um labels like uh, merge were starting and, and and stuff like that so i started kind of getting really into the american indie scene by the late 80s yes because yeah cause, 
because for me, kind of 87, only the Smiths break up, but then there's like the, the kind of, in this country, then ecstasy sort of starts to become the recreational drug in a way. Um, and also that wave of 16 year olds have kind of done their thing over the Smiths period. And then there's a new wave of people, not musical, you know, new wave, just a new kind of group of 16 yeah. and they yeah. want their sound. And it's suddenly a bit more dancey and a bit more kind of trippy. And then you had, you know, as you mentioned, the American bands like the Pixies and Throne Muses and 4AD records. And then you yeah. had Bleach and Sub Pop. But then we'd had Sonic Youth and Husker Du and the Butthole Surfers. So, you know, there yes. was that kind of all happening for us, which got very Yeah, and exciting. then the Manchester, the Manchester um, kind of more of the shoegaze scene too was coming mm. out of England that I was really into a lot of those like Ride and, and, and so forth. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Good then in ride. the early 90s, in the early 90s, I met John Langford from the Mekons and we started working together and we ended up our first thing we did was an alternative TV record which was like Mark Perry was recording a new record and we ended up working on it with him excellent and that, and that kind of opened me up I mean I was already into the gang of four I didn't really know the Mekons that much other than like maybe in the mid 80s um there was like a big feature in like one of the big music magazines in the United States about the Mekons. So like rock, you know, kind of in that like honky tonk and rock and roll era when they got signed to a and I knew about them. But then when I met John Langford, I kind of threw myself into their back catalog as well. And we've become like really good friends with them. And currently now I'm playing bass in, in, in the Mekons. Um, yeah. Through, through just randomly John Henderson meeting Langford at a post office. So, <laughs> <laughs> we love so how did you get to work with alternative TV? Well, it was John Henderson. Speaking of John Henderson, um, he uh, he ran in the Langford and when Langford first moved to Chicago, and Henderson was living in Chicago, and he had a label called Field It All Over at the time, and he basically um, got. Mark Perry to do an alternative TV record with him for him and when he ran into Langford he was like hey man would you want to work on this alternative TV record I'm, I'm putting together with Mark Perry and he goes yeah absolutely but I don't know any studios and then like Henry, John Henderson was like well I know a guy an engineer that could like work with you and you can go use his studio and so that's how I met John Langford and that My. was very early that was very early in meeting John Henderson because we worked on a um, Randall Lee um, record for his first Ashtray Boy record, which I played bass in, in mm -hmm. Ashtray Boy. So when did you start your kind of your musical career? When did your schooling finish? And then when did your studio then band world start? Well, it, it kind of started, it all kind of started at the same time. I mean, I literally have been playing, had a band with my brother since I was like 10, literally. And we started like recording just on tape recorders, like from the get go. And, you know, we were learning covers, but we were writing originals. So we would always kind of experiment with the tape recorders, put two tape recorders, bounce back and forth. So eventually, like by like mid high school era, um, other bands were hearing our recordings. So I kind of by osmosis became a record producer <laughs> because they're like, Hey, can you record our demo? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Come on over. And by then I had like a four track and graduated to better and better tape recorders, like eight track and 16 track. And um, Right. And so you, it was, it was all kind of self-taught in your. Yeah. DIY, totally DIY. Um, and basically at some point, like my parents were like, okay, you're, you're really serious about this and we can't stand having these bands coming over our house. <laughs> you know, like, you know? So like, they're like, and I'm like, well, I want to do this for a living. They're okay. Hot shot. If you're making money doing it, go ahead. So I ended up renting a house with a bunch of friends and building a studio in the basement. Right. And that's where we, that's where I recorded Randall Lee and met John Henderson and we're making these kind of, um, you know, low budget DIY indie records out of there. But then during the daytime, I was apprenticing at like a proper studio, 24 track studio called Seagrape, which was recording all the early like um, 
house stuff, house music, Chicago house music. So like in the late eighties, I was recording my day job was basically, I started as, as the apprentice, but because I knew MIDI and I knew sampling and all this stuff, and I was really into that stuff at an early age, the owners were like, oh, well, you should be engineering these sessions with us because we need more people that know how to run sequencers and stuff like that. So I ended up doing that as my day job and recording DIY indie records at night or on the weekends. My God, I'm so what, what's Chicago? Because yeah. I remember the, some of those Chicago house albums because I went and bought them because I was very excited at the time. I think it was a label called FFRR in, or London Records. In Yes, that, that, that was from London. So we would do, he, they would come over and we'd do remixes for them. But um, yeah, we did um, a lot of Hot Mix 5, which was a collective of house DJs in um, Chicago. We also did stuff for DJ International, Oh, um, yes, yes, I yeah, remember that. Yeah, and then the, probably the biggest artist that I personally got to work with an engineer was um, Mr. Fingers, Larry yes. Erd. Excellent. Fingers Incorporated. So I, I did his record, um, engineered his record with one of my mentors uh, for MCA, his first record, major label record. Yes. And then did a bunch of his, you know, 12 inches and stuff like that. But we did we did a lot of that and even Massive Attack like early on um, came over and did some house remixes um, and we ended up um, hosting a few of those at the studio. God, that's very cool, isn't it? Did you, yeah. I mean, because I remember that the first time because I was obsessed with the John Peel show, um, I remember the first time he played uh, Love Can't Turn Around by, is it Frankie Knuckles? That was yeah. That was awesome. I mean, did you love the music as well? Did you, was you? I did, I did. I, cause I was really into electronic music and I was really into like, I was more on the Wax Tracks label, which is out of Chicago. I was really into like Front 242 and the records they were putting out with more industrial stuff. <laughs> Definitely ministry, like early ministry. I was a huge early early new wave ministry and then even like when they went and did like twitch and some of their earlier industrial records before they became metalheads yes. um i really love that i really but i love that era and that's what really got me into like keyboards other than like new order and yeah and what about people albums. like the what about the young gods or liebach did you come across I, I liked liebach i like i like liebach there was a part of industrial that started getting a little corny that like, I was like, eh, I don't know. That's a little meatheadish. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, yeah. I was just, like, no, I was kind of more into like the, the, the hookier side of it. I mean, I actually liked the revolting cocks because like they, they had like good hooks and stuff. You know? Was that like, Chris like, Connell? Was that Chris? Chris Con yeah. Chris, Chris Conley and um, L Jorgensen and Luke Van Acker. And um, it was kind of like an industrial super group. And then around that time in the early 90s, this is a little after that, I got asked to play by Martin Atkins. I, I played on um, a pig face. Fantastic. Pig face. We love him. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, had, I, did some, I did some sessions with Martin Atkins that where he was producing a couple different bands for his I remember label. John Peel playing. There was one from Scotland called Finney Tribe who had these. Yeah, I love Finney Tribe. Yeah. Amazing, sure. yeah. amazing sound. <laughs> the bells, the bells. There you go. Classic. Yeah. So you're, yeah. so you're, God, that's, yeah, God, you were right there, yeah. weren't you? I mean, did you, I mean, because I noticed, I haven't spoke to a lot of bands, there was a bit of an issue when you've been in a band and suddenly you realise that there's a bit of a new scene and obviously the, the dance scene knocked out, like, knocked out a lot of indie bands and then you had this Seattle scene which also then knocked out another what, you know load of bands. Mm -hmm. How did you sort of, because it was kind of a funny period, like you mentioned, you know, they were shoegazing, but suddenly every record company wanted basically check shirts didn't they they wanted men in check shirts and long hair mm -hmm. and a <laughs> bottle of Jack Daniels talking about songs about their you know problems with their stepfather didn't they really there was a lot of grunge <laughs> bands that came along which were a little bit trying weren't they yeah well I you know it's pretty interesting my 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 studio career is different than my musical career <laughs> so like you know like um I, I kind of like just did like whatever kind of came across my bow, you know, back around then when I was, you know, I was trying to make a living and, um, you know, it's very, I mean, obviously I always wanted to be in, be a, in a rock band and make a living point being a, you know, in a band, you know, in touring. but, you know, I figured pretty early on, like, Hey, you know, I can have my day job be this recording thing. And so, 
um i my 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 discography is like way all over the place like you know i've done i've actually recorded some grunge records (laughs) (laughs) but um i mean i I definitely at a certain point like the rock and rollers kind of realized oh if you go work with dave he's gonna want you to repeat the chorus and you make hooks and stuff and that's not cool i don't we don't want to do that we just want to shred you know so like i ended up not getting those gigs anymore but you know um uh the studio part of my career has always been you know like at a certain point i started like kind of honing into what i really like to do and people kind of realize oh okay that's the guy he knows how to do this kind of stuff but because i work on electronic and i work on like you know more guitar based stuff i had like a good cross section where i could kind of work with anybody really yes so Mm-hmm. So just on the band front, how did that develop then, the Pulsars? Because obviously you bring out an, an, out an album, and I guess, that, is that the one that's been kind of repackaged and reissued on Tiny yeah, so Yeah, so the first release that we could, you know, the Pulsars, in a nutshell, was an answer to the grunge and the guitar only kind of like, you know, if you're going to use a synthesizer, you have to be playing raves and doing ecstasy. Like, what are you doing having a guitar and a synthesizer in a band? (laughs) So I, and being me growing up being such a new waver, um, this was about like 1994 or so. And played in different bands, played in a lot of different bands, but always kind of more guitar based bands up until then. Um, And I loved electronics and I worked with them in the studio. So I was just like, you know what? We're, uh, it's just going to be me and my brother. And we're just going to make like the music that just comes to our head, like whatever. We don't care if it's synthesizer, guitar, or whatever it is. So, um, and at that time, I was like doing a lot of indie pop. So there's a lot of indie pop influences in there as well. Yeah. So, so, you know, um, we formed this band and ended up like, because it was so different, we got a lot of attention on the local scene from promoters and ended up opening for Blur and Oasis. And it's a big, long story, but we ended up getting a big major label deal and then recording a whole bunch over a period of like four years. But then the label went out of business and my brother decided he wanted to go back to school. And I was like, hey, you know, I'm just you know we'll take a hiatus and i'll just go back to producing records and working on other stuff and that kind of like turned into like 25 years <laughs> but yes. we did get all the rights back to our stuff so we're just starting and one of the funny things is herb albert and jerry moss who own the label they didn't like apple music and they retired and they just saw the music business going in a totally different direction so they were like you know what we had a good run we're going to retire but they never digitized any of their catalog so the Pulsars never made it to Apple Music. So our music's all up to now has only been fan uploaded YouTube. Right. So, so 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 the first release we did that came out um, a few months back um, on Tiny Global that's called Lost Transmissions, and that's basically a precursor to a bunch of reissues we're going to do. Um, and it's all kind of more, more of the stuff that wouldn't fit on some of the records we plan to release. Um, and it's like B-sides and outtakes and alternate versions of songs that we did release when we were on Elmo Sounds, which was Albert Moss Sounds. Um, and uh, our next release is going to be reissuing our first LP, which is, you can find it on YouTube. But um, it will be officially released, and we'll we're we're in the process of remastering everything. Yes. And I, I have all the original mixes as well, and there's like mixes that I prefer over what what got kind of watered down by the powers that be. Yes. So so I'm ultimately it'll be the official modern version of the record, and the only version of the record available you know, on streaming and whatnot. So it's, it's kind of fun because we're able to kind of go back and um, I don't want to say reinvent, but we're, we're, we're able to go back and, um, you know, kind of do it the way we want to do it without yeah. any. Uh, well, it's, got, well, it's kind of interesting. A few years ago, I know there was a producer who worked on, did some bits on Dave, some of David Bowie's or one of David Bowie's 80s albums, mid 80s, late 80s albums, which had that, 
sound of the 80s that needed to be yeah. slightly taken out and then like okay you know yeah. I'm, he'll be happy with this I mean you know obviously he passed away but yeah I mean it's kind of interesting having a little bit of a tweak here and there I mean with that sort of signing to to that record label was that a was that really good business for for you and your brother and and your you know your future career uh you know I have no regrets I think at the time we got a lot of like crap from fellow indie rockers of chicago and particularly like you know oh you're such a sellout wait they went for the money you know but you know what hey you know it allowed me to do a lot of stuff it allowed me to buy better equipment i bought pro tools i was one of the first people in chicago to have pro tools which at the time was super cutting edge and i wouldn't be able to do that if i was like on merge or you know i love i love merge i love all the indie labels of the 90s but you know they were never going to be able to give me an advance where i could like buy the equipment that i ended up buying and so i have no regrets i'm not surprised i'm you know that's that's something you wouldn't you know that's they're happy days especially looking at it now sort of i think nowadays people are like Oh yeah, you uh, Honda wants to use our song for a commercial. Hell yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting. I heard Stuart Stuart Lee did this film about um, yeah the Nightingales, Robert yeah. Robert Lloyd, and you know they made it, and it was like getting funding for it and all that. And um, it was the it was the case that at the end of the day, you know, Sky, you know, bought it, and I mean, in a way, you know, it's like well there's so little money for artists now, you, you know, you have to take it. In the old days, you'd have said, oh, you did a, you know, you you say, you, you let your song be used in an advert. And that was always like, oh my God, that's so terrible. Now you think, oh, well done, you know, just get some cash and no one, there's so little money yeah. for artists now. You just think, you can't be that pure. I mean, I remember the days when Sonic Youth got murdered for signing from, from SST records to, I don't Geffen. know, Geffen, Geffen, that was it, my God. Yeah. I mean, you would have thought that they'd sort of, killed babies wouldn't you really so sort of, yeah the amount of grief they got so it's very well, that, you know. and that was definitely still kind of like in the water even for up and coming bands it was like no you you know you have to go with the small label first you can't just go straight to a major label yeah. you know so we were one of those bands that just kind of came out of nowhere and um you know i mean in a way i think we weren't probably in the t- at the time taken as serious because of it but and we didn't really care. It was actually this was like our first band. We like literally said we don't give a we don't give a, a fuck. Basically, <laughs> we don't give an ass. Like we're just like you know what? We're just gonna do whatever the hell we want to do. We don't care what people think. And um, that was the band that got the buzz that got the record deal out of all of the bands that I did up until then. You know. Yes, so. there's some nice story. I've got some nice stories. I can't quite remember them, but people who got the advance and bought some equipment. And then yeah. it all goes wrong, yeah. but it's like, well, we've still got the equipment and I can... It kind of set it. me up for the rest of my life. Which, Basically, you know, that's so it, isn't I, you it? Know. So, so, and what was it know, like that, What was it like supporting, you know, Blur, Blur and Oasis at that stage? Because they were obviously two bands desperate to crack the American market. Um, it, it was amazing. You know, I was a huge fan of Blur, um, Oasis. Uh, we uh, actually Ashtray Boy opened up for Oasis a few years before Pulsars did um, on their first tour, and I didn't. We didn't know who Oasis was. This would have been ninety three or ninety four. I can't remember. It was early. It was like it was it wasn't mid nineties. It was the early nineties. Sure. Um, and uh, so um, I just remember us um, booking this tour for Ashtray Boy. And um, Jay, who played drums, who did the booking, um, was like, yeah, we got, we're playing with some buzz band from the UK called Oasis. <laughs> <laughs> and we ended up opening up for them at like literally like a hundred person cap room in Cleveland. And, and there was a tour bus in front of this place. And we're like, well, who the hell are these guys? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and did you we meet? Up in our little hatchback, we're like, like, you're late for your soundtrack we don't need a soundtrack what what are you talking about you know? <laughs> <laughs> and did you get Where to meet <laughs> and did you make, get to meet alan mcgee no i didn't i did not i did not get to meet him um <gasps> but um uh uh for oasis when the pulsars opened at that point they're huge wonderwall was a huge hit in the united states we played a place called the aragon ballroom and um it was a sold out show and it was amazing and it was a huge catapult for the pulsars 
to get that gig. Um, and Henderson has a lot of funny stories about that era of the Pulsars. But um, uh, the f- highlight of that show is me introducing Cynthia Plastercaster to the Gallagher brothers. <laughs> right. <laughs> Good old Cynthia. I, I actually, my cousin goes way back with the plaster casters was one of the original plaster casters with Cynthia. And so I, I've known Cynthia. I, I knew she just passed away. Uh, RIP, yes. but, um, uh, but you know, I, I knew her really well. And, and, and so she, when we, she was like, Oh, doll, let me hang out. Can I come, can you put me on the guest list? I'm like, of course, Cynthia, you're Cynthia plaster catcher. You're going to, like, yeah, <laughs> of course. You know? So like, she's there and she came like early during sound check and was like, doll, Introduce me to the brothers. <laughs> God, and, and how did Eng- and how did some English musicians take to such an exciting idea? Um, uh, no, Noel was like he's he was uh, he was super into it. Like you know, like he was the nut- out of the brothers. Like that's the guy I talked to the most when I did get to meet them. And so I went up to him. And I'm like, hey, Noel. Um, this is Cynthia Plastercaster. I want to introduce you to her. And and he's like, Oh my God. He's like super. And he goes, he goes well, I got to introduce you to Liam. Like, you know, we got to go, you know, so we walked through this, like we're backstage and we walked through this series of rooms. And then we walked into this gigantic room that had an ice sculpture, a scroll French couch, a, 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 a vodka bar, like a guy built making martinis and Liam um, with like some escorts basically draping around him. I don't know if they were escorts or movies <laughs> or whatever. It was like right out of a movie. It was hilarious. And he kind of looked over at Noel, like, and here comes these people into the room and he kind of holds his hand up like, a, you know, like a king and he's going, what's going on here? And uh, Noel's like, uh, Liam, this is Cynthia Plastercaster. And all of a sudden his demeanor, goes, whoa, 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 hey, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Oh. I swear to God, it was like right out of a movie. It was God, that's crazy. a classic, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> God, that must have that must have been quite a nice gig to get to, to get on the sort of coattails of Oasis at that stage because yeah. they were they'd written the hits, hadn't they? They'd sort of got themselves yeah. going. And was it a good atmosphere on the on the tour with them? Well, we only did one show. We only played one show with them, and um, it was at the Aragon in Chicago, and. Uh, um it was a it was a really good show but they refused to play wonderwall like for, something was going on where liam didn't want to do wonderwall or something and you don't do that in chicago because chicago is the kind of town that will riot right. <laughs> so, so it ended up like they weren't gonna leave the building until somebody came out and played wonderwall so noel came out with acoustic guitar and played wonderwall and everyone disgruntledly accepted it as them playing Wonderwall and left with like a little kind of pissed off um, attitude, you know, but no right. But then, yeah. So was the band, you know, was developing then also you finish about eight, Mm -hmm. was it 90, 97, the band sort of gives it. Um, That's our first record. And we, we actually were recording up until, end of 99 um when the label disbanded so we had a second record that never came out but it it never really was solidified what it was we we recorded a lot of music under the name pulsars just because at that time i was able to like kind of put my full energy into it so between king size which was my studio at the time in chicago um and my home studio uh I was just always recording and writing and stuff. So yes, yeah. blimey. So then, so so as that was happening, your your sort of CV for for being the go-to producer is quite extraordinary, mm-hmm. isn't it? You you capture this kind of it's not quite alt country, but it is slightly mm-hmm. of a um, a rootsy kind of vibe, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, between working with the Mekons and and then um, doing a bunch of the early uh, Wilco records, um, like Summer Teeth and Mermaid Avenue. And then um, did some stuff with Nico Case, early stuff. Uh, John Langford, my brother and I were her rhythm section um, for some early 
shows when she was first signed to Bloodshot Records and um, did some early My Morning Jacket, the At Dawn record. Um, and But at the same time, I, I was really into kind of like the later indie pop. But I, uh, I, I did, are you familiar with the band Holiday? By any chance? Holiday? No, a lot. March actually. Records. March Records was a label out of Chicago that was doing some indie pop and like Minty Fresh. Right. Did a bunch of stuff with Minty Fresh. Um, but like in that time where I was kind of going into like the all country rootsy stuff, I was also doing bands like the Aluminum Group for Minty Fresh and um, this band called The Anniversary. Uh, um for the, this band called the get up kids had a label called heroes and villains along with this band um kofax so i did like two records for their label which are really great indie pop records in my opinion yeah. <laughs> uh, um and uh so that brings us into the early 2000s and i started like kind of developing more and more artists um one being okay go who got to deal with capital um, but, um, and also uh, a great singer songwriter named Patrick Park, who definitely fits into the kind of the alt country, but more folk, more alt folk. Yes. I mean, it's quite, it, I'm just staggered by the, the amount of bands that you've managed to sort of, to work through. Cause I did an interview with this, a New York producer who's got a studio called Martin, is it Martin BC? BC, BC, yeah, yeah, BC. Yeah. Who again, you know, people BC go sounds- because it's it's his kind of studio and his kind of kind of presence, I suppose. Do do you all did you also or have you also created your own sort of aura myth around yourself as, <laughs> as this kind of because there was kind of certain people, wasn't there? Steve Albini was one, I suppose. Trevor Horn had a a sort of particular sort of vibe about him. So did you also mm-hmm. have that kind of? Oh yes, you're the person to go to if you want to. <laughs> I guess, I guess, you know, <laughs> I don't think you'd make a decision about that. I think, well, you know, I always say like being a record producer is, is like 80% being able to hang out and be in the studio for a long time with people and 20% technical. <laughs> so, I, you know, so I, you know, I, I'm a musician at heart. So, you know, I think most, musician producer engineers people want to be in the room with them because they're creative and you create i'm able to kind of create the atmosphere that's, yes that, that's fun to be in and you know another thing like for instance the handsome family um i saw one of their early first gigs at this club called phyllis's musical inn in wicker park this would have been 1991 and i'm like who the hell are these people like i, I was they, they were like blowing my mind this kind of weird naive country music like kind of like if pavement did like like you know a you know classic country record or something you know? yes. um uh, and uh like hank williams meets pavement or something and I, right after the gig i like this is, i made a hat i kind of started doing this where i would just if i saw somebody playing and i really liked what they're doing i would just go up to them and go hey well who are you, are you recording and like let's make a record you know so handsome family i just went up i'm like who the hell are you and we're gonna make a record and they're like oh okay let's make it. <laughs> and i would just make the record and then find a label for that man because i would be like this is great we got to make a record and don't worry about it we don't have a label don't worry we're gonna do it we're gonna, we'll get you a label you know so i just kind of threw myself into these situations and i guess you know that's some of some of some of the reasons. Well, it kind of I, I I sort of I won't be able to remember his name now, but um, I suppose Suzanne Vega had a similar sort of story, didn't she? She sort of was played a lot in New York, and a producer who was trying to get into the record business thought. I think it was it, Mitchell Froom. I think it was Mitchell Froom. And and yeah, sort of started to develop. You know, like right, yeah. let's work with her. And then the guitarist mm-hmm. whose book came out last year with Patty Smith sort of also worked with her as well, which I'm no sort yeah. of. Yeah. That his book, it is. Yeah. One of those, oh yes, Lenny Lenny K Lenny, as well. Lenny so he, K, Lenny so K, it was right. like it was kind of interesting. You had a very similar experience with you know some of the bands like the Handsome Family as well. The that um, yeah. 
you took yeah. you took the idea and thought, look, you know, I don't know if you ever listened to it, but there's that kind of recording in the late sixties of the Trogs, the uh, in the studio where oh, they have yeah. an, an argument about sprinkling some fairy dust on the record, yeah. and it's yeah. just kind of. I just wondered if, as a as a sort of a producer and being in that experience, you know, that studio space, do you have you had experiences a bit like that, sort of where a band's been kind of creatively and emotionally stuck, and you've had to try and sort of you know, push through, so to speak? Um, uh, like when you're in the heat of the moment, you kind of don't really think about it. But I, I have like a, I have a way of just like kind of forcing people to do <laughs> like, uh, no, you're going to do it. Let's just do this now. And they'll be, oh, oh okay. Like they have no time to say no. <laughs> right. I guess I'm very convincing. I don't know. I, I, that's maybe one of my talents. I'm able to like get people to do things where they, just, you know, even if it's like, I don't know. I, I, that's, I never, you know, I actually, I never really have like thought about like, any of this stuff <laughs> Thanks. i mean i like it that's a good observation you know <laughs> i just yeah i just wondered what happens in those moments where you know someone comes with a half assed half-hearted idea or half-planned idea and you've got yeah. to try and sort of work out how you're going to do it because again you know i spoke to it's a, it's pretty interesting like yeah like you know you you kind of like part of the gig is psychology and assessing what's needed you know, there's some producers that are like, this is the way I do it, my way or the highway. Um, like, it, it, it's, you know, paint by numbers, like, you know, you're, if you come and work with me, this is what you're going to get, you know, yeah. um, where I've always kind of just looked at every project on its own and like, okay, what does this project need from me? How do I fit into this? Am I like the cheerleader? Am I the the driver, what am I here? You know, so every situation is different. You know, every member of the band is different and they all, usually the best bands always have like the chemistry between everybody. It's like this person's this way, this person's that way. And then the combination is like awesome, you know? So it's just knowing when to stay out of that or where, when to like push that and like, you know, or give direction when you need, when they need direction. But also be able to just like sit back and go hey like let's go get a burrito let's go down and have a drink you know <laughs> you know it's like there's like there's like you know knowing when to push and and, and not you know so I haven't spoke to quite a lot of bands. There's, you know, like they normally have a five year narrative, you know, and this is yeah. my classic, you know, the 12 month honeymoon period in the UK, they get a single out eventually. John Peel plays, they get a John Peel session, which is great with the famous Dale Griffith, you know, from the Mot the Hoople, that everyone has a horrible time yeah. with because he's a really grumpy man who hates the band, but he gets a good sound. They do the first album, you know, get their transit band, whiz around the country, you know, and the UK, as you know, is tiny, but every yeah. sort of town and city has an alternative indie night so they they get quite a few gigs so that's quite good so they feel like things are happening the second album sometimes a bit you know hard work the third album's often really you know this is the end but what sometimes with a band it's like I've asked them did you know when you were making that last album that the band was kind of over you, you know that was kind of you were having to go through it but as soon as it was done it was like you might or you might not bother and that was it I just wondered what it was like is it like for you if you sort of have that vibe of like god this band is really they've just got to get through this and then they're all going to be on their own way what? yeah yeah I mean I've, I've had both sides of that I've had people's first records and then I've had their last records <laughs> <laughs> you know and um I guess like there's never been a band where they can't stand to be in the room with each other. And I have to kind of like try to pull rabbit out of the hat, you know? Um, but there's times where I, you know, I've worked with bands that um, are kind of done with that iteration of the band, for example, or the main person of the band after we, we record decides, okay, that was our last record. And like, nobody knew that was going to be the last record right um, one one that comes to mind is um granddaddy and uh making that record with jason lytle and 
and then you know basically it came it was a fantastic record and i was like all i was you know it's great working with him but then he kind of like right after it said well that's we're not going to really maybe tour so much on this record and we're you know that was our last record and you know being kind of bummed out <laughs> you know? like, yes you know? <laughs> that or is... even like um built to spill um i did a couple records ago which was kind of the final record of like the classic lineup of the band and um you know it was a great record and it was made unlike most most of the record they it was all made by jamming like they basically all got together and it was incredible they're an incredible live band and they just would jam like 20 like literally i'd let the tape run because we were doing that on analog and i let it run until it ran out and that was like a song and we just whittle it down and make a song out of each jam right it was really fun it was really fun and like as a collective it was really powerful and not really realizing that that was the last record they were going to make yes sign of humbling what did you make then when you watch i guess you watch the beatles kind of um eight hour sort of film you know yeah let it be did you was did that sort of resonate a lot with you with listening absolutely hearing oh my God. john's talking and and their kind of interaction yeah. and the fact that they came to this project really with nothing and also the atmosphere yeah. wasn't great but as this sort of project went on the atmosphere seemed to get much better and better and then yeah. they were really rocking and you're thinking Oh God, I, I you know, because I was kind of dreading the end, thinking, oh, it's going to be a sad ending like the Titanic and all that. Yeah. And it's like, no, this is a really happy ending. It was like the band are going to go on to great things and do a massive tour and it's all going to be great and and everything's good. But you sort of realize that oh, actually that was yeah. that was it. Just played up on the roof and that was it. Um, you know, like that was an I I cannot, first of all, I cannot believe that that exists. Like the, did it did everybody know that existed i didn't know it i mean like the, to realize like wow that's been just sitting there this whole time and then one thing that hit me was oh my god these guys are just like everybody else there's just a bunch of knuckleheads <laughs> <You> know, like, <laughs> like they're just fucking around you know like they don't know what they're doing really you know like they're just coming in noodling around and going, oh i got this idea well check this out and you know obviously it's all you know it's legendary yeah I, I i mean the, 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 the one the one bit that really i was going to say the one thing that blew my mind was the the microphone in the in the sort of flower pot which you know they had that yeah. conversation <laughs> and and they probably can't well you know paul probably can't even remember having the conversation but then hearing it must feel really strange going my god you recorded that Jeez. yeah 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 Christ, that, yeah it was it yeah was no there, there's there's like just like the bickering that was going on like it's like that's what broke up the Beatles. Like that's like kind of normal bickering for a band, you know? <laughs> well, I kind of found, I found it sort of got, they seem to get much better once they saw, you know, the dynamic yeah. with George and George is leaving the band. No, he's not leaving the band. And then yeah. everybody was kind of happy and everyone just was having, so they had some terrible yeah. ideas about touring. And then it was like, why don't you just book the Royal Albert Hall for 20 nights and just go, we're just going to go to the Royal Albert Hall and yeah. just get it out of you, you know, because they were desperate to play live, I thought, and uh, yeah. and just rock and be a band again, you know. And they, I mean, God, I just I just couldn't believe how happy. But it was a bit like Scooby Doo because because for years we all thought it was Yoko, wasn't it? And then it turned out yeah. to be Alan Klein was the was the yeah. you know, the, the fame <laughs> this infamous character that everybody was like, you know, well, not everybody. John loved him and Yoko and everyone else was going, I'm not sure about him really. Even Glenn yeah, yeah. John wasn't sure, but it was you know he broke the Beatles wasn't he that was yeah yeah and it uh, yeah it was scooby-doo wasn't it <laughs> <laughs> yeah because um, I, I was just amazed yoko could be bothered to start sit there because you know it was like oh what the hell are we doing today but there you go yeah what was amazing was just like seeing like apple studios like that's their first session they did in there and it wasn't even really built yet you know yes. and like and kind of like the conditions they were recording and being a recording engineer, like it really kind of blew my mind. I was just kind of like, oh, OK, that's why that sounds like that, because like the mic wasn't even on the instrument properly. And that was the take. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, It's like my joke is to a lot of like younger engineers is like, you know what, Mike is the best mic to record that amplifier with. And they're like, what? The one closest to it. 
<laughs> yes, I know. I just I, there was a lovely bit when when they were sort of trying to fill up the album, and Glenn John was Johns was saying, "Oh, what's that song about the long, long road you started?" You know, it's like, and you think God, that is one of the great songs of our modern time, isn't it? It was just like, yeah, the way they were. Okay, we better we better record another song. Yeah, probably. Yeah. It was it was a facet I know, but as a as a musician and as a producer, I just thought you would be like mesmerized by the whole. Experience. Oh, you, uh, I've watched it twice. I've watched it twice, and I'm probably <laughs> going to watch it three, four, or five times. You know, because every time I, I the second time I picked up on stuff I didn't pick up on the first. You know, it's 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 incredible document that that exists. You know, I know. If only they did Exile on Main Street as well by the Ronan Stones, it would have been fascinating. They, there is that movie though, like it's not quite as detailed, but there is one where they're like in, most mostly them hang around their underwear in the French chateau. Yeah, <laughs> there is. There is, there is which, it would just be fascinating because the you know it's like the songs are amazing, the production's a bit yeah. muffled at times, but again, yeah. you know the circumstances of it as well. So just coming back to your your studio and your um, musical mm-hmm. kind of journey. So just roughly after the pulsars. I think that's how you say it. Um, did mm. did you sort of continue just playing with the Mekons? Was that your main sort of? Um, no, I, uh, I, I, well, I was an auxiliary member in the Mekons up until 2015 when they asked me to join permanently as the bass player. Um, but what I did is like I, I met my wife. Well, I, I knew my wife for a long time. We were friends, and then we started dating, and she lived in. Um, LA so I kind of over a couple years moved to LA slowly and got married and opened King Size Sun Labs in Los Angeles which has now grown to a bunch of studios that I kind of oversee as a business person and um uh I just threw myself into like producing and working with other people um mixing and mastering and all that kind of stuff too um that's amazing so you you sort of went from this david newton who was in the mighty yes. lemon drops is he yeah, in he's Sh- out here yeah he's out yeah. there as well with his and there's a guy for, called from a band called jellyfish who was from la who also seemed to yeah. have got a sort of roger setup. manning roger manning or Jason, somebody. Oh, J- Jason. Um, yeah, yeah, Jason Faulkner. Yes, that's the Jason one. Faulkner. He yeah. seems to be doing it. So, so yeah. So, what's it like, sort of, putting the business onto a bigger sort of platform? Uh, you know, it, most stuff for me just happens like somehow naturally, osmosis. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I'm a creative person at heart, and when I see things like. For instance, in the studio business, it became as the technology got easier and easier to obtain, which now you can literally record uh, an album on your phone, you know. Um, But uh, I noticed bands or record labels, the budgets were kind of coming down, but they wanted they would go into a big studio, but they wouldn't go in for the whole thing. They would go in to record kind of the band and then they would kind of go off to somebody's garage or extra bedroom in their apartment and edit and do stuff in Pro Tools and on the computer. So um, around 2005-ish, I kind of saw that trend and ended up um, kind of diversifying the uh, the sweatshop next to my studio, which was originally a sweatshop. Um, (laughs) <laughs> became available and the owner of the building was like hey do you want that and i'm like yeah i'll do something with it so i ended up building these um produ- production rooms which are basically control rooms like what what somebody would have in their garage you know like right like a control room and an iso booth so i built a building of those uh with five different rooms and um five different separate studios and this started renting them out to like fellow producers, mixers, composers, and that business kind of grew. So we're at a point where now we have uh, a few different buildings and locations and all in all have around 32 studios. Um, Jesus Christ, that's amazing. (laughs) 
<laughs> so, so, so you create kind of like hubs, you know, like kind of mini yeah. hubs, like self-contained yeah. mini hubs, which are like affordable, but you, you know, sort of more self. Yeah, they're affordable. Um, they're priced kind of in the middle, so it kind of weeds out. Like we don't want too much riffraff, and it's not really rehearsal rooms because a lot of times you'll find like with rehearsal rooms. There's, there's a lot of traffic coming in and out. Isn't that professional? And, yeah. you know, there's like there's like five bands sharing one room. So we kind of focus on like fellow professionals. And um, so we have, you know, we rent uh, MGMT has a room here um, in L.A., which is um, Ben, one of the members is his room. And then the next room is a studio um guitarist that does a lot of like remote recordings like you know for different artists and then we have a composer and then we have a mixer and then you know so everybody kind of has their little professional office and we have like shared kind of common spaces and stuff my god it's like um a better version of that we we work (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. It's, it's like a we work of music but it's all like super like the rooms are super tuned and acoustically treated i design them all and do all the like the um the tuning of the rooms making sure everything sounds good that's amazing um, and people bring in their own equipment people it's, it, they bring their own equipment in. um but we then we have our own standalone rooms too for tracking we still have the big rooms where you can record a whole band but then they can like you know so whoever is renting a room from us for their day-to-day room we give them a special deal and they can come in and do basic tracks and then they can go back to their room so that was kind of something i came up with and now it's starting to take you know more and more people are doing that as far as as a um you know a model a model to kind of afford but you 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 were the first you were the first person with this kind of idea that's kind of no i wouldn't say i was the first but i i feel like pretty early if not the first <laughs> yes that's quite amazing yeah, yeah. I mean I know that's probably you're boring but how did you cope yeah. what, with the last two years of the the kind of lockdown you did that sort of okay, yeah so 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 because of our model because of this model um our month to month what we call our month to months um they they kept chugging along because like everybody needed content so a lot of our clients are composers for Netflix and different varying streamers, you know, like uh, mixers for, um, you know, uh, show mixers and things like that. So everybody kind of like just hunkered down and that part of the business did, didn't change. You know, right. if anything, it just solidified the fact that people need the, that, and especially people who kind of have rooms at home and um they realized like after the pandemic like you know what i'd rather have a place i can get in my car and drive and go you know <laughs> rather than being home all the time so so um so it's kind of worked both ways actually um and you know the way we did it, we there were really our protocols were like really tight and it's like okay you only have you and if you have a client you know, escort them in, make sure they're wearing a mask, all that kind of stuff. So um, it seemed to work out good. Our day-to-day studios took a major hit, of course. Um, People get, you know, 10 people getting together in a room where it wasn't really happening, but um, it's back now. We're we're back now. So we we survived it. We survived it. Yeah. And and you must obviously, you're one of those people who must keep your finger firmly on the musical pulse. And I know from talking to various people, you know, no one really knows, you know, what what is happening in the musical environment. What do you, how do you sort of then cope with these kind of changes? Like, oh, this is the latest trend or that's the latest trend. I think, I think, I think think it's the same across all business. You know, I mean, I don't think the music industry is any different than any other business. I mean, you kind of just have to be ready to like adapt, you know, I feel like, like you're saying a five-year band (laughs) like i feel like every five years there's some kind of a major shift or paradigm shift that you have to kind of deal with yeah um you know uh so what's worked out really good is this model i kind of came up with but now we built a new place called gold diggers where i'm a partner i'm the studio partner on and, and it's a club and a hotel um it's an 11 room boutique hotel 
a nightclub um, that's all wired up. We have shows, nightly shows. It's also wired up to the studios, which is um, my partner bought this property that had Ed Wood's original soundstage. So the studios are on the soundstage. And in front of that is a separate building that has the club on the first floor and a hotel above it. Wow. And it used to be it used to be a transient hotel like Bukowski lived there. It's not, it's not Santa Monica in right. Hollywood, you know, East Hollywood. And so it has a lot of history. It's definitely the Dirty Boulevard. And the way we called it Gold Diggers is because the original club was called gold diggers and it's kind of this if you've ever driven up and down santa monica in la it's like kind of an iconic sign it's like you're like that is a cd strip club (laughs) (laughs) it's called gold diggers entertainment fantastic (laughs) so we were like well we're just gonna keep it gold diggers i think that's the name of it and so but um that's where we built um uh, seven studios with the 11 hotel rooms and it's kind of geared for the modern pop production where people are flying in you know we get we actually get people flying in from from europe uk asia australia um and where they can get a room they can have a little hub it's right there in east hollywood so it's like very centrally located and so like a lot of pop people like writing now it's like a lot of co-writes and things like that so they were able to host a bunch of that kind of um work right. for the town artists um you know we had dua lipa there not too long ago um leon, Br- leon bridges did his new record which he called gold digger sound he named it after the studio and he kind of camped out there and and hosted his sessions for three months for that record um you know we've had we've had a, we've had a fair share of like pretty big um, pop oh, yeah. Did you ever no. see or or come across that um, that fantastic kind of residential studio in the the Welsh you know the Welsh countryside called Rockfields where well, yes. He, yes so have I, you... I've heard of it I've never been there but um, my friend Ted uh, Ted Hutt who's actually in one of my studios right now mixing um, uh, Dropkick Murphys um, he's gone there before. Yeah, Rockfield. <laughs> Rockfield. I, that, that's where you know yeah. all those fantastic hits. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. yes, from Black Sabbath to Bohemian Rhapsody to a lot of the Britpop yeah. stuff, and it still runs. So I guess it's the same. It's the slightly same thing without the Welsh, you know, countryside and sheep bread, isn't it? Where you can just right. focus on what you're doing as a job. And of- and, and nowadays, like it's the, like this kind of goes back to like where people aren't just camping out in these mega studios for like months anymore. It's more like you know especially in the pop world it's more like producing with like samples and keyboards and things so you can do it in more of a control room iso both location that we do have a big sound stage that every room can tap into and we can record drums and we can record big piano we have a grand piano and all that stuff but you know most i would say 85 percent of the production's done in a control room with an iso booth and so so we kind of took that Rockfield thing and we made a whole bunch of smaller studios. So like, you know, you can have like, you know, five projects going on at once. But a lot of the bigger artists now, they'll rent out the whole facility. So they'll rent all of it out. They'll like they'll have like different producers in each room working on different tracks. Or, you know, there's the guy doing the beats. That's the person recording the vocals. So they'll kind of make it a factory for, for a given artist you know so yes well i would imagine do 